Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you all here. Um, my name is Emily uh, Neal. Okay. I'm the clinical director here at Mercy Home. And along with a couple of my colleagues, who I'll introduce in just a second, we're going to be talking to you about our process of ARC implementation at Mercy. So our objectives are to develop familiarity with Mercy Home's range of services and philosophy of care. So I'll kind of go through that a little bit. Understand the basic tenets of the ARC framework and then gain exposure to some effective ARC implementation strategies through the use of a clinical case example. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about Mercy Homes program, and then I'm going to talk about a little bit about the evolution of Mercy Homes treatment approach, and then I'll be passing it over to my colleagues here who are going to take it away from there, going through the ARC framework overview, implementation, and then the case example in the residential milieu. So to begin with, um, I think some of you are probably familiar with Mercy Home, even if you don't work here. But like Father Scott said, we've been around for 129 years. So we have a long history that I'll get into in just a second. But currently we have 134 beds here residentially, and about 90 of those are for boys, and then 34 for girls. I think that adds up. Um, our girls campus is not here. It's on the south side of Chicago in the Beverly neighborhood. <clears throat> And then we have an independent living program that's also on this campus as well. It's sort of on the other side of the cafeteria in an apartment building. There's two different levels, one for young men and one for young women. So we um, recently started a supportive housing program that Father Scott mentioned. It has 22 units for aftercare residents and their families who are in need of more supportive housing and affordable housing, which is a tough thing to come by in our community. So that's sort of a new element of our continuum. And then we have aftercare and community partnerships. So that's something that's also kind of unique to Mercy Home is that once you're a part of the family, you're always a part of the family. So you can come back to get supportive services, case management, connections to different resources in the community and some direct service as well. Last but not least, we have our Friends First Mentoring Program. So that's community-based. And I think Father Scott mentioned we have about 100 matches in the community with trained but volunteer mentors who spend several hours a week with kids in the community. It's a pretty high time commitment, which we've found to really be effective with the kids that we're serving. So briefly, I'll just kind of let you see how our residential programs are structured, because that's really the bulk of what we're going to address today. So um, at the top, you'll see those little orange people. Those are the ones that are kind of in charge of what's going on as far as an administrative, from an administrative standpoint. We have the um, therapist, program manager, youth care supervisor, then our day coordinator and academy coordinators who both have a variety of different responsibilities. Academy is our department that really encompasses all of the school, um, after school programs and career services. And then the day coordinator is really responsible for a lot of kind of the office coordination, scheduling of appointments, making sure the kids have what they need. Each home then has a certain number of youth care workers, depending on the number of kids that are in the program. Our ratio here is one to four or five. Um, that's where those little blue people come in. And then we have overnight youth care workers in all of the homes, um, as of now, right? Because for a while there was one that did not. So it had, we had to really accept more um, or less high risk kids, but we've really seen that the need for kids, especially 18 to 24 is becoming more intense. So we've tried to adjust our staffing structure to respond to that. So briefly, the evolution of our approach. We started as an orphanage in 1887 and eventually adopted kind of the concept of a therapeutic milieu. So we started in a very kind of behavioral way, tried to move toward a more strengths perspective and not just looking at what's wrong, but what's going right. Then we became a little trauma informed and now I would like to say that we are moving toward a more trauma responsive orientation. So here's some actual pictures from our history, which I think are always interesting. One thing that Mercy Home seems to be really good at is record keeping. So we have, we have records from way back in the 1800s from kids that lived here years and years ago and tons of pictures too. So it's kind of an interesting thing to look back at our journey. So really we were starting with the three square meals a day and a bed to sleep in and both of those two rooms are actually in this building over here. So um, the one on the bottom is what is now our pre-independent living program for young men ages 18 to 21. 
And right there, where the boys are eating, the old cafeteria, is now a training room that we have kind of over by the other restrooms around the corner. So um, like I talked about, we adopted the concept of the therapeutic milieu, which was really popularized by Bruno Bettelheim, talking about the power of a positive environment to affect change in people's lives who have been hurt or traumatized. Um, so his thinking was that if you take them out of a not-so-positive environment, put them in a positive one, it'll have a positive effect. So every interaction has the potential to be meaningful and therapeutic. We then, I think in the late 60s and 70s, adopted the family teaching model, or I've also seen a teaching family model, I'm not sure which one's actually correct, um, where we had house parents living here and kind of creating more of a family atmosphere, but it's a very behavioral approach. With like these, I've seen them before. I don't know. Have any of you ever used the family teaching model before? Yeah. So there's like little cards and different skills and things that people are supposed to be learning. Um, but it seems like it, it had a lot of merits, but maybe didn't go as far as it could in addressing complex trauma the way that some of the things that we're doing now do. So we tried to shift to more of a therapeutic focus, I think, in the 80s, 90s. But I, re I read through this timeline that we have that somebody put together, which was great, um, that they really struggled with managing safety and accountability with being therapeutic. And it's interesting because that's the same thing that we sometimes struggle with today. And I've heard other people have similar struggles. So in the 90s, Michael Durant, who some of you may have heard of, wrote a book called Strengths-Based, or Competency-Based Approach to Therapy and Program Design and Residential Treatment. And some of the leaders around here got a hold of this book, and it started to influence their thinking to start looking at kids as more than just a constellation of problems, but what is it that is going right and that we can leverage to help them kind of manage some of their challenges. In spite of those efforts, though, stricter behavioral approaches really reigned until there was a really significant shift in leadership around here in 2007. So I've been here since 2002, so I've been really privileged to kind of see this shift over time. And it's funny because for some people who've only been here a couple of years, they still think like, we've not made enough progress and we have so far to go. But I remember how it was when I first got here. And there are so many things that are different. And I remember as a young clinician thinking like, I don't really feel right about some of these things that I'm being asked to do, but I'm doing them because these people seem to think that that's what's best. But in my gut, I think I knew that some of those more punitive approaches were not working and that they were maybe what did he say this morning? Stopping, or earlier, stopping behavior, but not teaching new skills. So then, in 2007, our vice president of youth programs, Tom Gallardi, convened a group of people, led by Miss Lori Kennis in the back of the room, to start researching and putting together what we thought our conceptual framework should be. And those were the five different theories and approaches that we chose. So trauma being trauma-informed, attachment-focused, um, paying attention to family systems, being strengths-based, and continuing to include um, principles of milieu therapy in our work. So we developed that cute little yellow house that became the symbol for our conceptual framework. Um, but, and actually, I shouldn't say but, um, what that did was to kind of force people to get on board with a new way of thinking. And as those of you who've maybe been in a place for a long time and had experiences with culture shifts that it was really tough for some people. And we lost some people as a result because they just were not able to buy in to the idea that we don't need to be harsh and punitive and tough on kids and always focused on accountability. And that things like going to the gym and participating in extracurricular activities and having headphones in during study time were not necessarily privileges that needed to be earned, but actually necessities for certain kids. So um, we really kind of had to work with our staff um, to get to that place. And we lost some people along the way. Yeah, to, to add to that, just because if some of you were in Blodgett's presentation right before this one, he talked about the soft push to get some of the folks who are not aligned with the model uh, to potentially leave the agency. We had a soft push and we continue to have a soft push. We also had our vice president of youth programs with a bit of a hard push. Lori, what was his quote? Either you're... Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, get on or get off. He stood right uh, in this room and said, like, 
Yeah, but. like if you're not with us, you got to get off the bus. So he was pretty clear that this is what we're doing. And that's what it takes, I think, to make organizational change. But one thing we noticed after we had really kind of leveled out in accepting all of this to an extent was that it was not quite practical enough and we still needed more of a common language. So that led us to seek out something new. And in 2013, I had an opportunity to go to a trauma center institute in Boston. Jeremy had independently been doing some research and we came up with the art framework and thought, well, we didn't come up with it, but we, <laughs> I wish I could. Sorry, that. Margaret. I uh, know, um, but we thought it was really great and it seemed to be in line with what we were already thinking. So um, we convinced people around here to listen to us and they did and the rest is kind of history. So that led us to develop, to kind of further refine the framework to the mercy model of care that has really got arc at the heart of it. So I'm now going to turn it over to Mr. Carpenter. Um, the, a little more about we that. pop back and forth, but yes. <clears throat> so when we talk about the mercy model of care, one of the key elements that was really key to us was to maintain a lot of what we've been doing. When we're talking about implementation curves, I think also Dr. Blodja was talking about the idea that you need at least three to four years for some kind of institutional change. We've only been working with ARC in particular as the core framework for a little over a year at this point, but we view really this trajectory as a continuation of what we started back in 2007, in that again the agency has shifted dramatically, and this was the next stage in helping people really start to uh, be able to put things into practice effectively. So this graphic is kind of the top line representation of what we talk about as the Mercy model, which we think of as a trauma-informed competency-based therapeutic milieu model for promoting the development of youth and families. Uh, the heart of it is definitely going to be the ARC framework, uh, but what we use the ARC framework to do is to really guide if we're going to add on additional uh, interventions, if we think about crisis intervention, even how the language we use in CPI, we work really hard to ensure that we are unifying the language across all of the pieces so that staff don't feel like, okay, we've got a framework here for this, we've got a model for this, we've got that. Uh, we don't want a lot of code switching in the language, we want some level of harmony there. So we've done a lot of work to try to bring it together. Um, and the core element of it is, um, I'll talk about the pieces here, but apart from the ARC framework, which is really the brains and organizing piece of it. It rests on a general understanding of where youth are at in terms of their neurodevelopment. And we rely on a lot of Van der Kolk's work, but also Bruce Perry's work from the Child Trauma Academy. Uh, and we have maintained a really strong focus on caregiving systems. A huge part of our push uh, in the conceptual framework was a recognition that uh, Contrary to some of the older models that when you bring youth out of their environments, you have to make sure that we're not just teaching them to function in this space, that we're getting them back in their community. So a lot of family systems work. But this is another element of branding, of being able to take what we called family systems before and instead say, ARC is all about caregivers. And so we're going to talk about caregiving systems instead so that it's not there's not a clear distinction between the two. We're talking about the same thing. Um, so when we think about what this graphic represents, it's really representing at the lower end uh, uh, the neurosequential model of therapeutics, which is Bruce Perry's work, uh, which we're actively working to integrate because we find it to be a really uh, tangible way for our staff to understand what's going on in terms of neurodevelopment for our staff. And we're still early on in the, in the phase of building that in. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes with our training. But that, that's the base. You have to understand where youth is coming in developmentally, and that is going to guide you in terms of the choices you're going to make in the ARC framework itself. So understanding of neurodevelopment leading within uh, how we're going to time things in the ARC intervention. Uh, historically, if you're familiar with ARC, you may very generally see it in terms of this pyramid, which is typically how, uh, even in the book itself, the treating tra traumatized children and adolescents, this is pretty close to how it's represented. This is also how Dr. Blodgett talked about it. Recently, through some conversations with the trauma center, they're changing up some of the blocks that we'll reflect on. In particular, there's more of an emphasis on uh, the lowest level about caregiver engagement and integrative strategies. Um, and they've shifted some of the language. In particular, uh, effective expression is more about relational engagement. Can I express myself in a way that brings people closer as opposed to pushing people away? Um, so some tweaks in language, but all the core content is still there. Um, and so representing it in this house actually worked pretty well for us so that it ties back uh, rather than the pyramid. So for some of our staff, sorry, you haven't seen this yet. We'll talk about it in the fall, uh, which it is, but it's not quite yet. <laughs> so <laughs> Kat, we both are into this presentation that we're like, and this is what ARC looks like. She's like, no, it's, no, it's not, but all right. Um, same pieces are there. Um, 
So we're going to take a few minutes and talk about the core tenets. Um, so for some of you, again, this will be more review. For some of you, it'll be more, uh, it might be your first exposure to it. But the ARC framework itself is designed to be able to respond to a variety of levels of complex exposure to trauma um, so that you can address a continuum of exposures if they have acute exposures to trauma or more chronic, uh, that it's sensitive to developmental competencies and vulnerabilities. It's a very flexible, non-prescriptive framework for working with children. Um, and that it's really able to address, like we work not only here in the residential setting, but we have some really great coworkers going out and working with schools and helping them understand some of this in the same way that Dr. Blodgett was talking about before us, uh, but also teaching with families through some really good family work and also with our mentors. But it requires a slightly different frame uh, with each of those audiences. Um, so the top line version of what ARC is, is that it's three primary domains, attachment, regulation, and competency, thinking about skills that we're developing supported by three integrative strategies, which are engagement of the caregiving system uh, in a variety of levels, community, family, here even, making sure that we get buy-in from our staff members, uh, psychoeducation, and then routines and rituals as kind of a holding element. All of this in service of one overarching goal, which is trauma experience integration. So the ARC framework itself, we're going to walk through the four different levels. And I will name, during the last presentation I was in, when we talk about slide decks, some people will look around like, who's got a slide deck? Just as a reminder, all of this, you have this available online with that little business card you got this morning. So don't feel pressured to like try to scribble down anything we're talking about. Uh, yeah. Uh, does anyone have the little one? There was a little one you got at, at, at registration. and. Yes, and so in there, there's a little link, and all of the PowerPoint decks from presenters today are located there. So, um, so at the lowest levels we talked about is the integrative strategies of we have to engage the caregiving system, and this is one of the things, and Emily will talk about this with attachment that we loved about the ARC framework is that it doesn't take for granted the engagement of the caregiving system. It says in names, this is something we actively have to do if we have any hope of being effective with kids and families whatsoever. We have to engage them, bring them in, help them see the benefit of this. We have to do some psychoeducation so they understand why we're working this way. Kat will reflect some during her case example of some of the difficulties of helping a family understand why we are working with their children in the way that we are, given that it doesn't seem intuitive. It doesn't seem to be common sense approaches that are pretty popular. Um, and then routines and rituals, which is being able to look at structure as a vehicle of treatment, not structure as a therapeutic tool in and of itself, but structure holds everything that happens in treatment, provides consistency, uh, and that really if we're effective with it, we can help turn structure and routine into ritual. We can give meaning to the basic day-to-day -day interactions with our youth, which is a huge aspect of our milieu treatment. Oh, you have yours. Hello. So as Jeremy said, I think the thing that I like the most about this model is I not yeah um, is the fact that it addresses the caregiving system, um, and that certainly parents and guardians in the community, but it's also us as practitioners, teachers, whoever is an adult who cares about the young person. So caregiver affect management really refers to caregivers' ability to manage their own responses to the kids' behaviors that we're seeing. Because sometimes that's the hardest part of the whole thing. And if we don't have this block together, at least some of the time, the rest of it kind of tumbles out. And Jeremy has a great graphic somewhere that kind of illustrates that. Um, so we like to shorthand this one by saying it's check yourself before you wreck yourself. So then we move to attunement which is really being curious, um, being a feelings detective, where we have to look at what is it that's going on underneath this behavior that we need to address? What is the unmet need or the skill that they don't have? It's not about them being, as you would say, willful assholes, right? It's lack of skill, not ill will. So um, the phrase with this one is get curious, not furious. And curious, not furious, Paul? My, yeah, we have these awesome stress balls that you're going to walk away with today that say get curious, not furious. And my husband likes to use this one against me because I've taught him all about this. And he'll be like, get curious on this one. You're furious right now. Um, and then effective response. So we certainly have to respond to all problematic or unsafe behavior that we see. But it can't just be a knee jerk thing that seems right in the moment. It has to be effective in order to, to choose it. We can't just 
willy-nilly do things. We have to think about the individual, the situation, the underlying need before we do that. So that's attachment. And so what rests upon this, what we talk about the attachment level, we talk about it as a safe container for doing all the rest of the work. If we're doing effective integrative strategies, if we're effective with our attachment skills, it allows us then to allow the youth to start to develop uh, the capacities we're looking for them to develop that they hopefully, hopefully would have built in a good enough attachment relationship early on. But if they were lacking that, we're rebuilding it. And so the regulation stage from here on up, these are the skills that we're actively partnering with the youth in to build their competencies. And so it starts really on a mindfulness level, which goes along with what Dr. Vanderkolk was talking about this morning, of do I know what I feel in my body? Do I know, can I put words to emotion, yes, but on a higher level, where's my energy level at? Where's my arousal level at? And does it match what I'm trying to do right now? Um, and so really getting curious and trying to reflect what's happening with me. And this is the pair to attunement as well. Can I identify in other people what's going on with them? Because we know traumatized kids are pretty bad at reading other folks. And so a lot of this is, can I read me? Can I read someone else? It builds into the second block, which is affect modulation, which is if my energy level doesn't match what I'm trying to do right now, do I have a strategy to move it to where it needs to be to be effective? If I'm trying to go to bed and my energy is amped up, how do I bring it down? If I'm trying to study, how do I bring it down? If I'm trying to have fun, how do I bring it up? We've got kids on both ends of the scale where they feel really comfortable at one end or another and how do we move them? Um, and all this is in service of, can I engage relationships? Can I manage my emotions uh, in a way that allows me then to express myself in ways that is effective, rather than saying, get the F out of my room, Jeremy, as I come in to talk to a youth in their room. Can, they can say, I need a bit of space right now before I can talk to you because you're really escalating me. They're not gonna get there, but some element of, can they be able to engage effectively to not shove people away using their defense mechanisms? We have the competency level, which includes executive functions and self-development and identity. And I don't know about you, but I've always conceptualized executive functions to be about organization and managing my materials and being able to take notes. And that's certainly a part of it. But what I've really kind of expanded upon my knowledge with the ARC framework is how executive functions play into relationships and decision making. And that's what a lot of it in the book is about. So how do I manage conflict? How do I choose how to respond in this situation? How do I plan ahead so that next time I find myself in this situation, it doesn't end up the way that it did? So um, I think that's kind of the interesting part of that particular block for me. Then we move into self-development and identity. And a lot of the kids, Dr. Vandra Koch this morning was talking about the importance of imagination, which really kind of stuck with me. And I think that that plays into this block here. Um, the capacity to imagine myself as who I want to be or who I could be in the future and have adults help me explore that through a variety of different activities. Um, it talks about different aspects of self and how can you bring those aspects out and get kids to imagine what life will be like in the future or to really put out there, what do I like about myself? What's special about me? What's unique about me? Um, same thing, the identity aspect. So um, that's competency. And all of this is building towards uh, trauma experience integration, which is a summative block in the framework to be able to think about the idea that everything we're doing uh, is ultimately in pursuit of helping them feel like they can make sense of their lives uh, and that they feel like they have agency, that they feel they can move forward, they feel they have value. Um, also, like uh, reflecting back to Vanderkoek this morning as well, thinking, do I have someone who has an irrational love of me? Do I have someone who believes in me? Do I have a connection to someone? If we do nothing else in our work, it's helping our youth feel like uh, they want to be with people, that people are awesome is what we talk about a good amount. Uh, but a huge piece of this is, do I feel not so much like a victim of things that have happened to me, but do I feel mastery over these things and that they make me who I am and I can move forward in life? Uh, or, yeah, I use a take Pecos Bill riding a, uh, <laughs> riding a tornado. Uh, or if you watch the removed clips, there's uh, the second one removed talks about a, a tornado and, like, can she master that? And stars are born out of tornadoes. It's a wonderful metaphor. Uh, everything within the framework builds from the concept of everything has an overarching domain, and then there's core targets within each, and there's key sub-skills, and then it builds to techniques. This is one of the things that really drew us to it and helped us see that this is going to be effective for our frontline staff to be able to think in a much more prescriptive way rather than, I don't know, 20 of us sitting around and reading full, like old psych textbooks and then thinking, all right, this is the way it's going to work. Just get in there and like be trauma-informed, and then we'll tell you if it looks like it or not. No, this is a little bit more concrete to say, like, okay, are you doing it or are you not doing it? There's some 
some higher level of fidelity is what this was providing us. Uh, before we move forward from here to talk about our implementation process, are there any questions that are coming to mind uh, as it relates to the ARC framework itself? Cool. All right, let's talk about putting this in place. All right, so we had quite a journey um, from 2000, well, I guess the preparation began, you're right, in the fall of 2014 um, through the trainings that happened in January and February of 2015. So Joseph Spinozola was our um, consultant, and you'll see his picture on the next page, but um, there's Margaret Blaustein, who is one of the wonderful creators of this model. And I started by talking with her on the phone just to kind of get a sense of what this process looked like. And um, she had suggested, you know, if we can get any sort of advanced exposure to the model prior to the training, that would kind of put us a step ahead. So we um, put together these reading groups the fall before the training happened, just for the leaders of the agency, which in retrospect, I probably would have widened that to anyone who was interested. Um, but what we did was we had people, we gave them reading assignments, and then we came together to discuss in small groups kind of what we liked about what we were reading, what we were concerned about, what we weren't sure was going to fit, um, and what we were really excited to move forward with. And I think that really helped because people already had a level of um, understanding, exposure, and buy-in before the training happened. We also sent a few um, administrative level staff to Boston for training with Dr. Blaustein, so they knew exactly what to expect from the training as far as content is concerned. So that also, I think, was helpful in preparation. And then you'll see Dr. Spinozola in the corner there. Um, he has been our consultant, and he came and did two rounds of two-day training with all of our staff because we are largely a residential facility, so that means we have to be staffed 24-7. So in order to accomplish that, we had to do it in two different waves. Um, and he was an extremely animated and engaging trainer that was very helpful with um, a residential staff, I think. And Stacy Forrest, who's one of the program directors at JRI through the Trauma Center, came and talked about um, residential applications specifically to our leaders at the agency. And she was really helpful in helping us think through what are some of the administrative structures and things that we might need to put in place in order to make this thing come alive. So from there, we um, kind of the formula is you need to put together a leadership team who is going to be responsible for kind of directing all of the implementation activities throughout the following year which we did, and then came up with our ARC champions, a few of which are in this room, if you wouldn't mind raising your hands. All right, just nice back there. So these are passionate people who are doing the work every day and were willing to take more time out of their schedule to meet with me and come up with some um, interesting activities related to all of the different blocks that they could bring back to their individual teams and kind of facilitate so that we have a deeper level of engagement and connection to the material. Then, moving on, um, we've been working on, as someone came up to me earlier and wanted to talk a little bit about outcomes, we've started talking about outcomes and been working with Dr. Spinozola to identify measures that will kind of help us determine um, is ARC working as far as our implementation goes? Um, uh, the clinical calls and the systems calls are to, oh, yes, ma'am. So I'm going to turn that one over to Jeremy. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, previously, we'd been using uh, Achenbach, and we'd been using the Bears had been our two big things because we felt Bears was more strength-based, Achenbach was a bit more of a deficit-based instrument. Uh, we've retained Achenbach, and then we've added a series of other measures uh, similar to what the, the Trauma Center JRI uses. They have a system called CATS, I think, because they jokingly called ours dogs, but we didn't really. But um, <laughs> With uh, trying to remember what some of the elements are off the top of my head because we haven't fully rolled them out, but we're certainly adding in brief um, as an executive yeah. functions measure. Uh, there's one that is uh, measures dissociation, like yeah. dissociative tendency. Alexithymia is another one, but it's alexithymia dysregulation index. I think ADI. Mm -hmm. um, forgetting what some of the others are, but we could also you could connect with me afterward, and we can give you some information about what we're doing. Or still, Rachel Liebman is in the back related to trauma center. What's in cats? So. Yeah. So we're still we're still working on this. Um, but the clinical calls and systems calls um, happen monthly for the most part, where basically one particular we have 14 residential homes, and each month one home is responsible for doing a case write up 
that was then shared with the rest of the homes who then had to conceptualize the write-up through the lens of a particular block and then do their own write-up that all came to me that I compiled into a 20-some page document, sent to Dr. Spinozola for his input, and then we'd have these hour and a half calls where people would kind of present their thoughts and he'd get his colorful feedback um, throughout the discussion. But he was good at pushing us and challenging us in some ways. And um, I think we learned, a, I know I learned a lot from the experience. Our last one is next week with him. And then the system calls were really, again, about the nuts and bolts of implementation, but also um, getting some guidance and advice from him about when we would need to change certain policies, procedures, and practices, kind of getting some guidance from him on how to do that. And then we move into training. Cool. I'm going to give you some flavor of how we've been training it to our staff, and then uh, we'll transition shortly over to a case example, because I think that adds a lot more fun to this. But uh, in terms of one of the things we knew, as I named at the outset, we needed to do effectively was uh, not have all these different trainings that felt separate. We used to use Oklahoma. Uh, which I forget what the full name of it is, Residential Youth Care Professional Curriculum. Um, we would use that, and we also had our homegrown conceptual framework. We have CPI. Uh, we have a number of elements, and we wanted to make sure that they felt uh, coherent. Um, and so removing Oklahoma, removing conceptual framework, and starting to look at how does ARC guide all of our decision making, um, and then the other components that we're going to add in, such as we do utilize some of the components of NMT, and also SMART, which Dr. Vanderkoek was talking about this morning, the sensory integration. Um, and it in addition to making sure that when we talk about CPI, we've gone ahead and just started to talk about and use ARC language rather than the specific CPI language. So rather than rational uh, detachment, we're talking about caregiver affect management. And the meaning isn't lost, but it's helping our staff stay on the same track. We talked about the safe container a bit earlier. We represented as such, helping our staff recognize that as a team, they need to be on the same page and they have to be really effective with the skills that make up the safe container uh, before the youth are really going to be able to be effective in treatment. Um, so anything in the integrative strategies and on the attachment level. We have a number of tools that we use in uh, training sessions to be able to help staff learn these. As we think about implementation, I recognize that training in a classroom setting is not always going to be the most effective. So we have a long ways to go in making sure that we're really helping a lot of these things live out through supervision, through coaching in teams, um, when we're making some steps in that direction. But one of the things that we do is just an attunement deck where it's just a series of emotions and we have staff members sit uh, and just try to they deal out the cards and then try to guess what emotions are in each other's faces and discuss the attunements and the misattunements. Uh, mostly, we, we intentionally put resting face in there so they can all be like, oh God, I can't tell the difference between that and my angry face. And then we also do, we have them all use a digital camera and build an emotions chart for themselves. And so getting to look at, can I guess a day later what emotion I was showing with this face? Because a lot of times it seems contrived, but a lot of our youth in the moment, they're going to walk by a staff member sitting in the staff office and make a quick judgment as to whether or not they want to talk to them based on what mood they see. Um, if they're going to engage in a dialogue, hopefully they'll get more context. But there are lots of little moments where we have to be accountable to how are we coming across and starting to set that stage for our staff members. Uh, there's a game that we play to get at more of effective response uh, where there's two decks of cards. One is dysregulation regulation that has a list of pot potential triggers that a kid might have and a few coping skills. And so they're just randomly assigned on those cards. It could be like large men smell a perfume for triggers or something in regulation, bouncing a ball. Or we have some ones that aren't super great that'll be on there as well. It could be substance use or something for a coping skill. Um, and then observable behaviors, anything from coming back late from a past to uh, masturbating in their room to all kinds of things to just say, all right, you're going to see these behaviors and we'll need you to get thinking about how you're going to respond in the moment. And so we use this board and have them sit as a team and talk about potential, potentially how are you going to make decisions to slow down the process from reacting to responding. And the basic notion of it is, is they'll deal out an observable behavior and then put a, play a youth trigger and coping skill card. And before they can do anything about how they're going to respond, and this we have to keep reminding people, nope, step back, nope, step back, uh, to go to natural outcomes first. What's going to happen regardless of what we do? To make sure that we're putting that into the equation to think about, do we need to add anything else? Sometimes we don't. What are the natural outcomes? Then we push them to reflect. How does it make me feel? So getting curious about our internal states. How does it make me feel? How might my caregiver have responded if I did this? Uh, what do I need to do to avoid triggering this youth and help co-regulate, which relates back to the triggers and coping? And then we ask them to get curious in response. We say, brainstorm two possible reasons a youth might do this, and then choose a logical response that fits. 
And so it's really pushing the, the, to think that two youth going AWOL from our programming might go for very different reasons and it might call for a very different response. Um, even if we might want to have a certain level of consistency, we need to make sure that we're pushing ourselves to individualize. And this exercise really pushes people to start thinking in that manner. Now, we do a lot of posters around the home, and you'll see some of this in different ways represented through Kat's examples, but we use the energy house, which we got uh, through some smart training, being able to think about where is their energy at from in the basement through the roof and using the inside out characters for it from low energy up through high and figuring out what feels comfortable and effective in different spaces. So the ideal is to have it hanging in the learning center and the gym uh, near the back bedrooms to think about what energy fits for this and where are you at and building it into transition times to help youth be more effective. Use posters, this is like positive shaming, which isn't great, but how safe is your container? So it's the ARC framework starts with you. Well, actually, it starts with attachment, but attachment starts with you. Uh, so getting people to really think about before you ask what's wrong with this kid, ask how safe is our container? Because uh, oftentimes there's pretty, pretty big parallel processes going on where staff are out of sync, and it's not really about them. Sometimes it starts with where are we at? Are we being effective? We use the arc in action sequence of observe, modulate, do, and we have it on the back of all of our badges that our staff carry around um, to be able to think about reflecting in the moment, get curious, attune to the youth. I'll use some silly stick figures to illustrate this, but there's the three core steps of taking uh, arc and making it active. Um, posters about getting curious, not furious. Well-regulated caregiver. Uh, an effective response requires a well-regulated caregiver. Um, when we teach it, I'll briefly name this, is that we do uh, a two-day course for everyone in our agency, uh, regardless of their roles, to help make sure they understand the core tenets of the ARC framework, but also we go through elements of human development, trauma exposure, how that impacts uh, how the youth are going to be functioning, uh, and our target population, and then the ARC framework is all what we're doing on day two. And then we spend another two days looking at uh, getting our staff members to practice active skills and explore this in greater depth. We do utilize, we, we spend a lot of time helping our staff recognize uh, what's going on neurodevelopmentally. I won't spend a lot of time on this because I will assume a lot of familiarity with it, but we use uh, both kind of a hybrid of some of Bruce Perry's pieces to think about the brain structure because it's easy to grasp, uh, but we also use uh, Dan Siegel's hand model. So a lot of our staff, parents, and youth are familiar with the concept of flipping their lids where you know, you've got brainstem, limbic system, cortex, and prefrontal cortex and that during the fight, flight, freeze response, we flip our lids and that we need to soothe and calm back down before you're going to be able to be effective. And that historically was one of the things that was a big aha moment for a lot of our staff to think about why that lecture in the moment of dysregulation went nowhere. And how do you, you have to first sometimes meet basic needs and calm that youth down before any kind of learning can happen. So. And that's been really fun with parents, too, or the advancement coworkers walking around me like, man, you're flipping your lid. Uh, so, I was but, just going to say, Jeremy, my husband's also familiar with the hand model. As, as is my wife. We <laughs> talk about it at home, so I'm just like, Jeremy, on him. all right, bring it back down. But yeah, it can be really helpful, and you always have it with you, so it's a really simple model um, to be able to utilize. Um, the arc in action sequence, as it's spelled out through arc training, uh, the observe, modulate, do, in kind of an academic sense, we talk about it more with these little ridiculous people. Observe is reflect, get curious, not furious. What's driving this youth's behavior? What are they feeling? How am I feeling? Am I ready to help? You have to do all that work before I'm going to jump in. Then I need to modulate. I need to regulate myself, take steps to get myself back in my window and think about what are these youth, what is this youth's coping skill? How am I going to partner with them to co-regulate? And then I'm going to do. So there's a lot of sitting on our hands before we jump in. And when we talk about effective responding, we're talking about repair. We're talking about reconnecting with that youth. And we talk about getting them to reintegrate back into what we were doing as soon as is possible uh, to not have a lot of consequences that require youth to stay out of relationships. A lot of our youth have attachment difficulties where they would be much happier not having to be with people. And it doesn't make a ton of sense to send them away. So instead, trying to see, can we get you to be with people and to be able to respond appropriately? All right, so like Jeremy said earlier, I, um, I'm a therapist. I'm in Mahoney Home. I've been here for almost three years. So some of the language that we use in this is something that I use every day. So if I kind of skip over something really quickly, just jump in and let me know. Um, all right, so first I'm going to walk us through just what Mahoney Home looks like, the population that I work with in my program. 
Uh, then we are going to go through a case example of one of the youth who I currently work with. And then finally, we're going to go over um, just some general ways that we've implemented this uh, in Mahoney Home. So Mahoney Home, we, right now we're working with males uh, age 13 to 17. As you can see, uh, some of the treatment concerns they present with are some more what we would call outward behavioral concerns. Uh, definitely aggression, AWOL behavior, substance use, um, also experiencing one or more inconsistent attachments in their home setting is a pattern that we've seen a lot. Uh, and our youth are building skills in identifying and expressing emotions, problem solving, communication, and study habits. So this is our case example. His name today is Mark Money. Mark came to Mercy uh, in March 2015 at age 16. He runs away overnight, has threats and actions of suicide and homicide. He is physically aggressive at home and at school. With reported blackouts, he often shuts down and refuses to interact with his family. He functions well below grade level at school. He's been involved with the police and DCFS due to his runaway behavior. When Mark came here, he had previously been diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder, depressive disorder, NOS, bipolar disorder, mood disorder, NOS, disruptive behavioral disorder, and intermittent explosive disorder, and PTSD. So at that time, Emily was actually the director of admissions. And so when we get this information on paper, how did admissions feel about this case? <laughs> Well, I have to say, this was a situation where the father was desperately trying to get services for this kid. So he had files and reams and reams of paper and documents, basically outlining how terrible he was from his IEP, school reports, hospital, all of that stuff. And because I saw so many records all the time, I read that and I was like, mm, I don't think this is a good fit for our home. And I said no. But the case manager who had actually met the young man really challenged me. He's like, there's something special about this kid. There's more than what's on this paper. Like, let me proceed. And I said, I trust you. Go for it. And I was totally wrong because we were very much able to help this kid and his family. So I like it when I'm wrong like that. <laughs> Absolutely. And as you can see, what the information that we got here is pretty much what's wrong with Mark. This is saying what's wrong with Mark. So what we wanted to do was look at what's happened to Mark, not what's wrong with Mark. So that way we looked at a timeline of his life. Um, Mark was born in 1999. At two years old, his family lost a child. This impacted his biological parents' ability to emotionally support him. Uh, he experienced neglect, parental depression, and a confusing structure. Clearly this loss had an impact on his family as his parents divorced at five years old. So in that age range from two years old to five years old. As we know, attachment is very important. Getting those emotional needs met is very important. And from what we've learned from Mark's example, he wasn't getting a lot of those needs met at that time. Uh, by six years old, he was already seeking, or his parents had sought out outpatient services and he was already taking medication for, um, I believe it was ADHD at the time. And by seven years old, he'd already had his first psychiatric hospitalization. At eight years old, he was kicked out of school. 10 years old, kicked out of school. 12 years old, he was placed in his first residential treatment center. This treatment center was restrictive and punitive. He's described it as having to wear scrubs. So really a lack of ability to really show any self-identity. Um, and it was a locked facility that had a lot less um, kind of ability to express yourself than we have here at Mercy. He's reported this as being a very negative uh, experience in his life. So after leaving residential, he had been living with his mother during the week and his father on the weekends. Um, at 13, mom decided to send him to live with dad due to his threats and aggression becoming um, more difficult happening on a more regular basis and also more physical as he's going through puberty, um, getting stronger and, uh, the safety in mom's home environment was becoming an issue. Uh, he was hospitalized 
a few more times um, at 13, a couple of times at 15. Uh, and then at 15, he went into an intensive outpatient uh, treatment. Um, this really focused on oppositional defiant disorder, and it was a very behavioral-based treatment. This was not effective for Mark, and he eventually was asked to leave the program and referred back to residential, which is how he landed on our doorstep in April 2015. So we're going to go through how we, do, we have done treatment planning with Mark in his case. So in the attachment domain, these are some of the following areas that Mark uh, has, have allowed Mark to feel safe enough to build a trusting relationships. He's responded very well to consistent routines. Uh, in Mahoney Home, as you'll see later in some pictures, we keep a lot of visuals posted. We have um, our youth care workers, uh, like Connor on her, <laughs> write down a schedule every day so when the youth get home from school, they're able to see exactly what they're expecting. Any special appointments, tutors, uh, family therapy, anything like that goes along the side of the schedule so they know if there's going to be anything different or additional um, in, or in addition to the regular schedule. Uh, limit setting has been very effective with him, uh, bonding over shared interests and supporting his habits and allowing him to spend time in the administrative offices. So allowing him to take some uh, small breaks and hang out in the supervisor's office, the program manager's office or my office, just getting some one-on-one -on -one time and really connecting through that relationship building. Uh, in the regulation domain, um, he did a daily check, emotional check-in with staff after school. So you'll see an example of this as well later on. The, um, he had a bulletin board from his room that he created. We called it like a Mad Lib, but really it was more of a fill in the blank where he um, chose from thought, a list of different thoughts, emotions, and needs that day and filled in the blank for himself. Um, this helped him to start being able to realize, hey, you know what, I think about my mom like four out of five days a week while I really never talk about her. Maybe I should start talking about her. So it helped him to kind of having the visual of the things that he's thinking about, being able to start connecting that and figuring it out for himself. Uh, he's also had weekly assignments that focus on connecting his mind, what's going on in his mind and his body, uh, therapy sessions that focus on how to release his emotions in healthy ways, and weekly check-ins with his treatment team in order to provide a safe place to release his emotions. So release is a word that he's responded really well to, which actually kind of going along with the mercy model, it ties in, that's a CPI word, so it ties that into ARC treatment as well. Uh, so here's some examples of Mr. Mark's work. Uh, this is his energy, where do I feel? Uh, and this is something that he actually did fairly early on in treatment. He uh, was asked to color different, or pick different colors for different emotions, which you can see down at the bottom, and then show where he feels those emotions in his body. So as you can see, happiness takes up pretty much the entire top half of his body, where Anger, fear, and sadness are all from the waist down. And when I asked him, like, wow, it's kind of interesting that you feel sadness and you feel fear in your foot. Like, what's that about? And he's like, well, I run away every time I feel those things. And I'm like, duh, like, okay, of course. Like, I completely get it. So him starting to be able to be self-reflective and seeing that that's how he responds to those things and happiness it's something that he feels up top. All right, and then in competency, uh, we've worked a lot with it, helping him ide identify his uh, sense of self. We've really encouraged hobbies for him. Um, he has me time that's scheduled into his week, which he calls it his me time, where he gets an extended amount of time outside of program to kind of go around, hang out with some friends, as long as he meets other requirements of program. Um, he also has specific goals that focus on problem solving. Um, this started with help from staff and has evolved into problem solving without support. Uh, when he first moved in, if a problem fell across his lap, something as small as getting laundry done or something like that, I'm looking to Connor because he's <laughs> been a part of a lot of this, um, it could turn into a full-blown meltdown in a matter of seconds. And now 
even with just being like, hey, man, let's problem solve. Like, oh, you know what? I could ask the overnight Jabbar to wake me up so that I can throw my clothes in the dryer in an hour. Okay. Problem solved. No meltdown. I can go to bed regulated. So he's done a lot of work in that area as well. Uh, and then in the trauma experience integration blo or, um, domain, he has been able to start working on a trauma narrative timeline. This is something that he has been in therapy um, with many therapists across uh, the course of his life, as you could see from his timeline earlier, that he has not been able to work up to until this point. Um, it really took all those all the blocks leading up to this to get him to the point to be able to regulate enough to start talking about memories of his past and to start talking about, um, you know, the not just the positive events in his life, but also some of the um, not so great significant events that have uh, impacted his life. He also leads his peers in understanding um, the body's alarm system. So understanding hey, you know, like kind of that picture earlier of like, yeah, when I feel fear, it's in my foot because I run, I've got a flight response. Uh, and he's able to name for other, for other peers, like, hey man, you're, you're having a fight response. Uh, so here's an example of him being able to use his false alarm. So this assignment asks for youth to name certain triggers and why that makes their false alarm go off. So an example of that would be hearing people yell in a loud tone of voice reminds me of the times that I was yelled at a lot. Um, and so Mark was able to name when people of authority tell me to come here, it reminds me, it triggers me. My false alarm goes off because it reminds me of how I always got into trouble. As you guys saw, he got kicked out of multiple schools. So that helps us understand that helps his mom understand that helps his dad understand that when we might just say, Hey, Mark, like, come here, I got to talk to you real quick. He could get set off, you know, and he could become dysregulated because it reminds him about how he always got into trouble. And so starting to help him connect to those things has started to help him, uh, realize like, okay, I am having a false alarm response and those have decreased significantly. Um, in the caregiver engagement therapy integration or treatment integration. Um, so he has had consistent monthly family therapy, which I feel has been one of the biggest aspects of his treatment and has been one of the major reasons why he's been so successful, uh, in Mahoney home. Uh, I've engaged both of his parents in exploration of their own childhoods and being able to understand how that's impacted their parenting styles. Um, they've been given a lot of psychoeducation on the effects of the, tr of trauma and the fight, flight and freeze response, which is available in the back of the ARC book. Um, there's a lot of different parent handouts that are really helpful in, uh, sharing that information with parents. Um, so a lot of our families and I'm sure other, um, staff in here that work in other programs have experienced this as well. Um, have had a difficult time with ARC sometimes in feeling that our approach is a little bit soft. And, um, and so ARC has really been able to show like using the examples of ARC and how it's an evidence-based treatment. We've been able to show the family how the approach is, a, um, is evidence-based and there's a method to our softness. So the psychoeducation component that comes along with ARC and helping to teach parents and caregivers about this has been really helpful and showing that, okay, we're not just being soft and your kid's not behaving well here because like, we're just letting them get away with everything, but there is a method behind it. Um, okay, what was my... Oh, both of, um, Mark's parents have engaged in the parent resources that we have available at Mercy Home. There's a lot of different things that we offer to parents here. One of them is Strength in Numbers, which is a uh, bi-monthly parent support group where uh, over the last year, we focused completely pretty much on ARC and the different strategies that we take. So helping parents understand that, helping them also be able to vent to one another. Um, and then we also have a women's retreat that happens each year where um, our uh, women caregivers can get together and support one another. Uh, we ask the family for feedback and encourage more structured weekends that include fun one-on-one -on -one time activities. So not just having structure here Monday through Friday, but 
making sure that some of that structure is going home on the weekends. And we've done that with a lot of our families and it's been really successful in helping to um, make sure that youth don't move out of here successfully and then all of a sudden, oh, we're seeing the same problems because they're not having the same uh, amount of structure that they were experiencing in Mahoney Home. Can I add something to that? Yeah. <clears throat> Mahoney Home is especially good at doing home visits. That's another part of this whole picture, too, where you all will go and maybe have a staff spend four hours in the home during the day observing or giving suggestions or feedback to parents and caregivers about how they could adjust some of their routines or intervene in situations where maybe they didn't handle something mm -hmm. as effectively as they could have. And I think that's been a big part of your success with families too. So Thank kudos. You. Thank you. Um, and providing a safe space for Mark to express his emotions to his parents and vice versa. Uh, that's something that was not being done at all in the family home prior to his placement and treatment. And we worked our way up in family therapy to it really becoming a place for them to be able to start expressing their emotions to one another. Um, even in his you know, trauma timeline, he named as one of the biggest significant events in the last year is that he was able to tell his mom how he felt about what happened when he was little. And I felt like that was a very powerful statement for him. So here's Mark. Uh, at 15 months of treatment, he is able to problem solve in the moment without crying. Uh, he can name when he needs a release. He's transitioning right now back into main, to a mainstream school with the help of his school resources coordinator, Andrea. Um, he is on a high level in Mahoney Home, which he's worked his way up our phase system. He's able to advocate for himself. He seeks out support and uh, staff to process his emotions. He can identify causes of his anxiety and eliminate them, like past alterations and asking for schedule changes. Uh, he's great. He has greater skills with preventing and recovering from aggressive episodes. He values relationships and accepts feedback, and he's more consistent in his hygiene and less reliant on sleeping as an avoiding or as avoidant coping, I'm sorry. And up there where I say that he can identify the causes of anxiety and eliminate them. So an example of that is that past alterations, uh, he was able to recognize like, hey, I've got this past coming up right before I'm going on this big trip and I'm feeling a lot of anxiety about it. And instead of flipping tables upside down in my room or cursing out a staff member, I'm going to go to the program manager and I'm going to let her know how I'm feeling and that I'm experiencing this anxiety and he advocated for himself and he was able to get that pass altered. So really being able to recognize what he needs and then approaching staff in an appropriate way. So now going into Mahoney Home as a whole, other ways that we have worked with our youth in um, implementing this model uh, and attachment, we uh, use bucket filling, which is, we've got a couple books over here that we can pass around. Has anybody heard of bucket filling? <laughs> so the idea of bucket filling, I guess I'll fill everybody in, uh, is that we all have our own bucket and we can either fill each other's bucket by positive interactions or we can dip into each other's buckets by negative interactions. And when we fill each other's buckets, we fill our own bucket. And when we dip into each other's buckets, we're dipping into our own bucket. Um, it's something that the guys have responded really well to um, and part of the language that we use in Mahoney Home. So if I'm wrapping up group therapy last night and one of the youth comes over and helps me pick up the markers on the floor and put them all in the box, I'm like, hey, you know, thanks for filling my bucket. Um, so just being able to say little things like that really has incorporated the language into the home. Uh, we do advocate and therapist outings, so specific one-on-one -on -one time that we get out of the home and go out and either like have dinner together or go uh, bowling, lots of different things that we do with each other. Community nights is a consistent part of our, um, our programming where all the staff and youth play games, uh, have a movie night, do different things as a whole program. Uh, fish and plant care is a big part of our treatment. It, we use it for empathy building um, for a lot of youth who might struggle to, uh, 
to build or show empathy for others, um, having something for them to take care of and to nurture, we've seen be really uh, helpful in them building attachments. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think there's been one incident maybe where a kid showed some aggression towards a different kid's fish, but uh, <laughs> luckily we were able to stop or step in and handle that before um, anything really bad happened. But we have uh, our system where the plant care has to happen before the fish care can happen. So there's a system where if you can show that you're really invested in taking care of your plant, then you get to get a fish. Yeah. We do honor we do honor goodbyes to, to the fish who you know R I P in Mahoney home. It's sad, sad times. Um, we like I said earlier the visuals of the schedules and expectations. Uh, our staff I believe is amazing at following through on limit setting when a limit has been set. If it's set the night before by the overnight staff and you know they leave for the day the staff that comes in the next day make sure that that limit is held. Um, that's something that has really, I think, created, although a frustrating at times for youth space, um, definitely a safe space. They know that things are not going to change. They know that no matter what staff are there that day, they're going to have the same environment, and it really does create a safe space. Um, we also use staff meetings and supervision to address inconsistencies in programs. So if any of us see like, oh, hey, you know, like Thursday nights seem like they've been really like wild lately. Like what's different about Thursdays? What's going on? We get curious uh, with ourselves as well. So here's some examples of some of the things that we have in program. There's our, one of our plants down there. Um, this is our September schedule. So. We've got um, holidays on there, the different youth who start schools on which days, um, somebody's internship appreciation dinner. Uh, we always have birthdays listed up there, any community nights. So that is actually out in our milieu so the guys can always see what's going on uh, during the week. Um, and then over here we've got our bucket filling, an example of bucket filling. So this is actually, uh, staff bucket filling. Uh, this is something that we have hanging in the hallway, so we always make sure that staff are modeling um, our interventions for the youth at all times. Like, I've got my lizard with me right here, my coping skill. Um, but we, uh, yeah, so we came together and we listed what are some of the things that fill my bucket, some of the ways that I fill other people's buckets so the youth are able to understand, like, okay, these are some of the ways that I could do this myself. And in regulation, oh, so the house that Jeremy showed earlier with the going through the roof and going into the basement and uh, the, the being in my house in between, um, that's something that I do in therapy sessions within the first couple of weeks with each youth who comes into Mahoney home. So developing that common language early on and being in my house means being regulated, being calm, being able to hear what other people are saying and engaging in to and conversation. Going through my roof means hyper aroused or high energy, and then going into my basement is hypo aroused or low energy. Uh, we have group therapy sessions that focus on body alarms. We have coping skills everywhere in the milieu. So, like I said, we've got our weighted lizard. I think there's a is it the weighted blanket back there? Yeah, right, we got the weighted blanket going on back there. <laughs> uh, we've got balance boards. Um, kinetic sand, which I don't have any of that down here, but lots of coping skills that are in every office. Um, they're in, we've got a trampoline in the middle of the milieu. There's all kinds of stuff, that, um, for the guys to use, uh, whenever they need it. Um, and again, st staff modeling, model the use of the sensory and regulation tools daily, especially me. Um, we practice coping skills with the, when the youth are calm. So every Sunday night, uh, we have a million meeting where announcements are made for the week. So the guys know what to expect, but then there's also a coping skills practice group where there's a different coping skill that's presented during that time when the guys are calm. 
in order for them to practice it then so they're more likely to be able to utilize it whenever they're in a dysregulated space. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also often schedule emotional check-ins and um, regulation time into their individualized treatment plans. So if a youth definitely needs to have an emotional check-in each week or each day, uh, a staff will be assigned to make sure that they have a specific time each week or each day to meet with um, with the staff and get some one-on-one -on -one time to check in. And then competency, we have weekly executive functioning classes each week where youth focus on different areas in EF. Uh, individualized schedules to accommodate their hobbies. So we want to encourage after school activities and other ways to develop their self-identity. So we will work to uh, individualize those schedules. We have physical education in group therapy. So that might be mindfulness. Over the summer, we brought in a yoga instructor and did yoga for quite a few weeks in group. Um, the youth are also really encouraged to co-facilitate group with me. So um, if they have an idea that they'd like to talk about something they're passionate about, um, they'll work to uh, work with me to develop a group and then facilitate it. Uh, and then we have monthly job skills groups. So here's some more examples of what goes on in our home. This is the welcome to my house wall. So uh, again, kind of that house idea that we were talking about. Can't really see in here, but each of those is either a staff or a youth filled out a card that says different things that bring them into their house, either from their basement or from their roof. Um, this is our reframing wall. So youth came up with statements and better ways that they could reframe those statements. So instead of saying, I'm not good at this, they can say, what am I missing? Here's some of our youth <laughs> practicing their coping skills. It only happens four times, so make sure you watch it. <laughs> I don't know why only four. <laughs> so there's a body sock over there. We've got some bubble wrap that's definitely used a lot around our home. Uh, bouncing a ball. We've got one of our guys right there with this lizard right here. And then emoji pillows, which are pretty awesome that a lot of the guys have. And there's some kinetic sand on the, on the desk right there. I'm trying really hard not to say these guys' names right now. So. <laughs> So this, the one of, of uh, this guy right here is actually in his room. He's standing like pretty much in the doorway of his bedroom. That one's in his room. That one's in the hallway. And these two are in their room. This so they're roommates. Yeah, absolutely. And this is kind of that board that I was talking about earlier, that fill in the blank board. So coming up with... I'm thinking about blank and having the different, the blue ones being the things that that person might be thinking about, I'm feeling, and then the pink ones being different emotions, and then right now I need listing different coping skills. So this is somebody who is currently starting to work on this um, as a check-in every day. So um, kind of like what we did earlier with Mark, um, helping to create that sense of understanding like oh, okay on certain days i might be feeling a certain way um oh wait those are the days that i've been listing that i'm thinking about my family or that i'm thinking about what's been going on at school and helping to really start to connect their thoughts to their emotions and behaviors um these are some specific tools um and again this will be on the the PowerPoint that you guys get. Um, but these are some of the specific things that have really worked for us in Mahoney Home. Um, and a couple examples of them. So this is a treatment planning priority checklist that we've used uh, with some of our youth. So thinking about Mark when he first came into program, um, definitely needed to work a lot on um, his modulation uh, and so that could have been a three for him circling a three over there and his ability to kind of control what's going on for himself um, and so we can use that and kind of list out the things that are most important to focus on while treatment planning 
Um, these are some of the other tools that we use. These are all in the back of the ARC book as well. Um, talking about my feelings and that where do I feel. So kind of similar to the one that Mark filled out um, earlier, but with some different emotions listed there. Um, so some of the challenges that we've faced with uh, incorporating ARC into treatment have been engaging caregivers and learning the ARC approach. So again, fortunately with Mark, he's got a family who, um, with parents who are both invested in um, the treatment plan and have been able to see the progress that he's made. Um, but some of our parents do have a more difficult time in understanding uh, and understanding the approach and the more soft approach to uh, therapeutic treatment. Um, and, uh, and also helping staff and caregivers see the ARC is not replacing limit setting, but rather helping develop a lens and an approach to set limits that will help the youth learn and build their skills. So what is the role of the milieu therapist in this? Um, my role is I meet with direct care staff monthly to, grow, to collaborate and support them. So that's something that didn't start right away with ARC, but started kind of um, after we've been implementing it for a while. And just by having these monthly check-ins, it's been really helpful in incorporating ARC into not just the therapeutic treatment, but also the behavioral goals and uh, lifestyle goals that the youth care workers are working on with their advocates. Uh, also incorporating regulation tools into group therapy. Like I said, um, we've got like balls bouncing during group. We've got um, all these guys out there. And as long as they're not major distractions, um, they do help a lot of the youth to stay focused and regulated because 50 minutes is a long time to ask for a lot of these kids to st sit and engage in a group therapy session. Um, Again, the routine of explaining and completing the youth's energy house early in treatment. Um, this does promote a common language with coworkers. So we use a lot of the language of ARC in our everyday conversations with one another in the log so that we can all understand what's going on um, when we're not here. And we are able to provide an evidence-based approach when working with families. So again, if families are like, what is this? This is some crap that you guys are doing with these fam with these kids. <laughs> like we can be like, no, actually, like, look, it works. So there's proof. There's evidence, um, which has helped some families become a little bit more open. All right. Any questions?